Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. True immigration reform has stalled in Washington, and the proposed federal and New York State Dream Acts, which would pave the way to citizenship for undocumented immigrants who came to this country as children and provide financial aid to undocumented college students, have come no closer to being realized. But an executive order signed by President Barack Obama in 2012 created a special non-permanent immigration program that grants social security cards and temporary relief from deportation to young people who came to the United States as children and who meet certain criteria. The New York Immigration Coalition is involved in the effort to reach the estimated half million young people in the United States who qualify for the program but haven't applied. Our guest today is Elizabeth Plum, the coalition's coordinator for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, also known as DACA. She'll tell us how the program works, who qualifies, and how the city's outreach efforts are going. Welcome. Thank you. Why don't you tell us a little something about the New York Immigration Coalition first? Of course. The New York Immigration Coalition is a policy and advocacy umbrella organization for about 200 groups in New York City and state. We work on policy and recommending policy and then advocating for those policies in the realms of education, health. We also work on critical integration initiatives and civic engagement initiatives. So that's integrating and engaging both undocumented immigrants in New York City and state, but then also engaging them in our civic process once they do become citizens. Okay. So tell us about DACA. Of what course. it is, what it does. Of course. So as you, as you just said, DACA is a special non-permanent immigration program. It very much came to be because, as you also said, the federal DREAM Act had stalled. And this was a way for President Obama to say and understand that there is a very needing population of young kids and young adults who deserve something in the time that we wait for the federal players to Get their, act something, get their act together. You said it. <laughs> so it is for individuals who came to the United States before they were 15. You have to have met certain age requirements at the time, certain schooling requirements. And if you meet those criteria, which we can go into more detail if you'd like, you can then get a work permit, temporary relief from deportation, with the work permit, you can get the social security number and card. So the work permit, the work permit comes first. The work permit comes first. Okay. So with deferred action, any deferred action program, you you earn the right to get employment authorization. Once you have an employment authorization document, you can then request a social security number, and you can also get a driver's license, which is very critical for many individuals, particularly in New York State, where you have to typically have certain ID documents in place to get the driver's license. It also affords a very critical amount of normalcy in the lives of really bright, wonderful individuals who contribute so much to our society. Mm -hmm. And um, so you gave us some of the requirements. They also have to enter, have entered the United States before June 15, 2007. Exactly. The age range is basically from 15, uh, in terms of eligibility, is basically from 15 to about 33? Yes. So it, it gets a little complicated. <laughs> it's a lot of dates and it's a lot of June 15th. But Obama made the announcement, President Obama made the announcement on June 15th, 2012. So to qualify, you first have to have entered five years before that date, by June 15th, 2007. You had to have been 15 years or younger when you entered the United States, so you couldn't have already turned 16. 16. And on the date that President Obama announced it, on June 15, 2012, you had to be under the age of 31, so okay. 30 years or younger. Okay. So that means that your date of birth would be after June 15, 1981. Okay. So okay. if you do all of that math, it basically gives us a, a 15 to about 33-year age range. There is one critical exception for those individuals who are already in removal proceedings or were already deported but are still here, they can qualify when they're younger than 15. Okay, okay. Uh, and that, that age range, I mean, most people, when they think of DACA or, you know, anything related to the DREAM Act, they're thinking of little children, of you know, course. or college kids. Of course. So it's important to know that it covers, applies to a lot more people than that. Is it, exactly. The 
DACA program helps a lot more people than the DREAM Act would necessarily. The federal DREAM Act would require two years of college. DACA is much more expansive. I see four main population groups that qualify for DACA. We have first have, of course, our DREAMers. So those are- would be college students. Those would be college students, individuals who are in college, who have already graduated from college. We then have our individuals who are usually also clumped with the main DREAMer population. These are individuals in the K through 12 system now who presumably will go to college. So we have those individuals. We then have the individuals who aren't in college but do have a high school diploma or its equivalent, and that's the terminal degree. And then we have one last critical population, and those are the individuals who either dropped out of school here in the United States or have no schooling here in the United States. These are individuals who wouldn't be on the radar of the DREAM Act if it passed, unless they were to take many steps. And they do qualify if they enroll in a qualifying program, such as an ESL class, such as a, a GED, HSE class, they can then enroll in DACA. And that's a really critical element. And it's that population of which there are an estimated 16 to 18,000 in New York City. It's that population that we're trying to reach right now. Okay, okay. But there's a strong uh, requirement that you must have either gotten an education or be getting one or you must be currently going in to school get okay is what they say and okay. then currently in school can have a few different interpretations and if you're not currently in school you can get in school yes. and qualify for DACA which is a very generous element and it's an element that you did not have to be in that schooling program when President Obama announced the program you can enroll at any time and then after that enroll in the DACA program. And it could be like a GED program or some kind of job training program. Exactly. Or, and okay. there and the New York City DACA initiative, which I'm sure we'll discuss in a few moments, has a many, many adult education, adult literacy providers who have exactly those types of classes that meet the requirements at the federal level to be a qualifying program. Okay. Now where does one go to apply for DACA? For DACA. So if if it isn't jumping ahead any, I'd love to talk a little bit about the New York City Initiative, okay. which offers a <clears throat> collaborative program of about 100 providers. So we have outreach providers who are going out into their communities, finding individuals who might be eligible for DACA, and then they're making simultaneous referrals to legal providers and to adult education providers, depending on what that individual needs. So we always say you have to go to a lawyer, an attorney, a Board of Immigration Appeals accredited representative to know if you're eligible. And they then fill out your paperwork, and this is all free through this New York City initiative. These are all free services, free lawyers. So you don't have to pay for a lawyer. You don't okay. have to pay for a lawyer. And so they will not only tell you if you're eligible for DACA, but they'll also do a full legal screening to see if you might qualify for something better. Mm -hmm. There are many individuals who walk into your everyday DACA screening and find out that they're actually eligible for other benefits that would lead to a green card. So, you know, one being special immigrant juvenile status. So it's so critical and important that individuals, even if they say, if they see the DACA requirements and say, oh, well, I actually came in in 2009, so I know I'm not eligible for DACA. We still say, go to the lawyer. It's free. You just have to be in the age range for this initiative. Okay. And, and find out, because you might be eligible for something else. And at the same time, if you're eligible for nothing, which is the unfortunate reality of most immigrants in the United States, you know that. And then you don't fall prey to a lot of the fraudulent practices and notarios who are out so on the we streets. We can hook you up. We can hook you yeah, up. Yeah, right. exactly. Right, okay, to get your papers. So <clears throat> where do you go? I mean, in the outreach program, where do you go to find these people? Of course. So these, we have 26 outreach providers in the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development Initiative. The New York Immigration Coalition coordinates those 26 outreach providers. These are groups that are already trusted and established in their communities, and they vary they're, they're across the board, everything from Mexican cultural organizations to financial empowerment organizations to groups that work with day laborers and restaurant workers, other groups that are, are quite famous as far as organizations in, the, in, in New York City, such as the Children's Aid Society, groups that are very much in the community. 
So we offer them the training and the education and an idea of what DACA is. And we say, don't reinvent the wheel. Add this on to the wonderful work that you're already doing in your community. So these groups, if they're in schools, they start talking to people at the schools about DACA, the parents of children, going to PTA meetings, going out and doing your classic street outreach, putting up posters in, in immigrant neighborhoods like Jackson Heights and Sunset Park. And these are groups that have the language skills to reach individuals and can break down fears in the language that a parent or an individual speaks. So the different places that individuals have gone and our outreach providers have gone have been so innovative. Working with the consulates has been really wonderful. Going there, you have at any given day in some of these Latin American consulates, you'll have two, three hundred people coming through to get their basic identity documents, mm -hmm. such as a passport. Well, while they're there waiting, which can many times be a three, four hour <laughs> wait, why not talk to them? And we've also developed a pre-screening form. So it's a one pager, it doesn't determine eligibility, but it, it allows the outreach providers to have a screening and referral tool. So they can get a basic idea of the questions they should be asking, the demographic they should be looking for, and then they can make the referral. And at the same time, we can track critical, we can take those pre-screening forms and start to get a picture of what the population being reached looks like. Now do we know, have an idea of how many people in New York City might be eligible for DACA? Definitely, about 86,000. Wow. And, and that we, who, uh, who, who have not yet signed up, does that include the ones who have already signed up? Well, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, which is many of us call immigration, that's right. the, the division under the Department of Homeland Security that works with the DACA program. We haven't seen up-to-date statistics on how many applications have been received in about six, seven months, so we can't really say. And then there's statewide numbers. But of, we can say basically, in New York, excuse me, in New York State there are 86,000. Okay. Seventy percent of those are in the city. Okay, okay. It gets bigger when we start talking about DACA eligible today and DACA eligible if you were to enroll in a qualifying program. I see, okay. So that expands the number. Okay. And so we might be looking at as many as 100,000 in the exactly, city? Exactly, okay. exactly. We're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back with Elizabeth Plum, Outreach Coordinator for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program at the New York Immigration Coalition. <music> Welcome back. I'm talking to Elizabeth Plum, Outreach Coordinator for the Deferred Action Arrivals Program at the New York Immigration Coalition. I was reading somewhere, it may have been on your website, that in New York State, only 34% of those eligible, likely to be eligible for DACA, had applied. Why so, is that number still good, and why so few? Well, I think, <clears throat> unfortunately, we're probably still under the 50% mark. I think this initiative was very much in response to those numbers and across the nation enrollment rates weren't where they should be. We're looking at 49% a year out in June of last year that had applied. Of those eligible. Of those actually, eligible, okay. exactly. And that was 34% in New York State. And since the majority of those individuals who are eligible are actually in New York City, it says that the majority in New York City also hadn't applied for DACA. I think it's for a few reasons. The first is that New York City, what makes it wonderful and what makes it a wonderful place for immigrants is it's so diverse. We don't have a majority at all of an immigrant population, which is very different than other cities such as Los Angeles. You mean a majority Hispanic? It, or, or, precisely. So okay. in a place like Los Angeles, you can do a wide outreach campaign in Spanish. So it might not be a majority country, but it might be a majority language spoken. New York City does not have that. And then when we look at some critical populations such as the Chinese, well, there isn't one universal Chinese language with there are so many dialects. And it really makes it difficult to do 
just one outreach campaign. Everyone has to be doing outreach campaigns. So that's one reason I think it was difficult to really get the word out. There are other smaller considerations, like perhaps the fact that in New York City it isn't as necessary to get a driver's license. So that's one of the main reasons why some people might apply. There also, cost was a barrier. It's expensive. Cost? It's $465 to apply. Really? Yes. And so one of the elements of the New York City DYCD initiative are that the legal providers who are funded through this initiative, actually part of their funding covers the fee that you would pay to immigration. So I think cost was a barrier. And I think a very critical barrier was uh, the misperceptions around DACA. That because it was associated so much with the DREAM Act, because very active dreamers were what pushed Obama, I think, to grant this program. And so they were very deserving of having their association with the DACA program. They were the ones that came out immediately and enrolled. But we have to realize that the biggest population are those individuals who aren't dreamers. And so that's where we then see sort of the relative shift and why the percentages of those applying weren't so high. Mm -hmm. We had a branding campaign around DACA that had lots of caps and gowns and schools and kids with books and high achievers which is wonderful, but that doesn't as much speak to the individuals who qualify for DACA but aren't dreamers. Right. Those individuals who maybe have never gone to school, perhaps they never, they didn't come to the United States for education. Might they be a here single to work. mom with kids working. Exactly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if they see an ad that's advertising for DACA with a kid in a graduation gown smiling because they've just graduated from college, they're not necessarily going to self-identify with that picture and say, oh, I should ask about DACA. So one of the amazing things is when we do outreach and when we get out into the communities, sometimes people just don't know about DACA, but more often than not, they know about DACA. But don't know that it applies to But don't to know them. that they, they say, oh, the, the, it's called many different things, Obama's law, the law for the dreamers. And so they'll say, oh, yeah, I know about that. And I say, well, do you know that you could be eligible? And they have no idea. Okay. Now, um, you've talked about uh, the legal referrals, the free legal referrals. You also, I mean, your outreach program also, which is paid for by the city council, by the, by the way, funded yes. by the city council, also offers adult education classes. Yes. So somebody who could qualify for DACA if they enroll in, in a GED program or a vocational program, yeah. you, you offer these, these classes? Yes. So the initiative is, it has, about 35, I want to say, adult education providers. And so these are groups that do GEDs, which we now call the high school equivalency okay. in New York State. I, I have to keep trying to remember that. But what we know is the GED, which does still have currency, I think, to call it that. So Spanish HSE classes, GED classes, English classes. English classes can qualify because they lead to, to jobs and to further education. So we have all different kinds of providers. Our outreach providers and our legal providers can make referrals. And because so many people were kept out of the program, as I said earlier, about 16 to 18,000, because they lacked the educational requirement, this initiative at its core is really an education initiative that looks to get these individuals into programs so that they can then qualify for DACA, but it says so much it's workforce development, it's economic development when we get people learning English, right. bettering their education. Now, does one have to have completed a GED or completed an English as a second language in order to be certified under DACA? No, you just have to be enrolled okay, okay. In, in the program. So, so you enroll, for instance, and you qualify, and then what happens? Do they issue, are you issued a Social Security card? <laughs> no, you, are, you, are you issued, what happens then? Yeah, so when you, when you get everything together and you're ready to apply, so you, let's take a case, perhaps someone who's never gone to school, they enroll in an English class, they then go back to the legal provider and say, okay, I'm enrolled in the English class. They get all of their proof together. You have to prove that you came into the United States in time. 
and that you meet all of the other requirements. The lawyer fills out your application. The lawyer, because if they're part of the DYCD initiative, they then have funds to pay for your application, so they'll write their, your check for you to immigration. You send it to immigration. They send you receipt notices. They then send you uh, appointment to get your fingerprints and biometrics taken. You then, there's a, a wait time of a few months, and then in the mail comes an approval notice and your work authorization document, which is a small card. And then you can take that and get a social security card. Then you card. take that and you can get a social security no card. You take that and you can get your driver's license. You can do so many, that's sort of your, your critical foundational document. Then. And about how long does the process usually take? About six months okay. right now. Okay. And, and if they do it through your pilot program, then they don't have to pay the $465 fee? Is, it's, it's, is it totally free? It's totally free. It, now, of course, the, the fees are at the discretion of the legal providers. They, an individual might say, I can pay $100 and they want to feel invested in the process, which I think it's similar you know, to when we pay for our own college educations in a way. We want to be invested in this mm -hmm. process and have ownership over it. So legal providers can pay the whole thing or maybe they decide to pay less, but in most cases it's the entire program is paid for. Have you witnessed, have you personally seen how DACA approval has changed people's lives? Oh, completely, completely. It, changes people's lives in the ability to of course work legally in the ability to have a social security card and feel like when you go into especially for these individuals who have gone to college and are so smart who have degrees in chemical engineering medical school there are lawyers who you know individuals who are so high achieving and then they can get a job, they have a social security number, but I think perhaps the, the biggest element is just the normalcy it provides, the safety and security in knowing that you are protected, even if it's only temporarily, from deportation, that you're not going to be separated from your family, your children, your friends, the life. Some Dockers came here before they even have memories. Some of these you know, dockers, dreamers, whatever we call them, they are Americans. Mm -hmm. They might mm -hmm. not even speak their, their native language. So having a little bit of normalcy, feeling a little bit more American when so many of them identify and love our country, I think that's a really critical element. So DACA approval, as, as you said, is it's temporary. It lasts for two years. And yes. then what happens? What do you have to do after two years? It needs to be, so DACA itself is subject to renewal and you will need to renew your status. Now we're coming up on the renewal. It'll be happening this summer. That's when, when most of the initial individuals who applied, their work authorizations will be expiring and they will need to renew their DACA status. And what's qualified? What's required in order to renew? Do you have to show that you're still in the course, or what do you have to show? Of course. So this is all being determined by the Department of Homeland Security right now, working to put out some, some FAQs, some frequently asked questions, some guidance on the renewal process. So we're still waiting on that. We should see it by hopefully the end of April, early May. We presume that it will be you won't have to send all the physical presence proof again, that it'll be more or less a routine renewal such as other immigration programs like temporary protected status for Hondurans, Salvadorans, Haitians. They have, it's, you, you fill out the form, you send the money, you put in a copy of your old work permit and you send it in. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that'll be what the process looks like. As far as sowing continuous enrollment in an educational program, we're still waiting to see how that will be handled and what the guidance will be on how that. Many, how many people have has your program processed so far? I know that last I heard, we have processed about 2,000 people have been reached by the services. I think 300 have, have gotten direct services. Either they, they qualify and have applied, but we're still waiting. The mm -hmm. initiative didn't get rolling until late fall, so we're going to have to wait until June when the first year of the initiative is done to really roll out the numbers, which we will be doing. So what have you learned um, from your experience, um, from your work as DACA coordinator, 
um, that may have influenced your feelings about immigration reform or, or whatever? <laughs> what have you taken from this experience? I think we got about a minute. Okay, I have really learned how critical not only high quality services are, but services that come from the community. And we see that with outreach, adult education, and legal. The community-based organizations that know their specific communities and populations can speak the language, can relate to an individual on a very basic level are going to be the best. We've learned that and we've learned the importance of collaborative structures where collaborative programs and initiatives where we all work together. And we need that. If we're going to have immigration reform, which I hope we will have something, we're going to all need to work together. Mm -hmm. Where is the, what's the status of the Federal DREAM Act now? Is there any movement there? Which, and, and the Federal DREAM Act really puts young people uh, who came here with their parents um, on a path to citizenship. citizenship. Yes. Where is that now? Is it just stalled? Or? It's stalled alongside all the rest of immigration reform, and we would really like to see. We would like to see it as part of a greater comprehensive immigration reform package. And it's all stalled, and we're doing our best to make sure that that is not the case, and that we see movement at the federal level. Okay. Very interesting. <laughs> we're out of time. I want to thank Elizabeth Plum of the New York Immigration Coalition for joining us today. If you'd like to get more information about the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program for yourself or for someone you know, you can contact the coalition's website at thenyic.org. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.